Amen, amen. Good to see everyone's faces this evening. And God has given us another day of life, another day to glorify Him, to understand and know Him who He is, know His will, and to draw closer to Him so we may have fellowship with Him in this yes. lifetime and so we can also be with Him forever. That is the goal, saints. Um, this lifetime is very short. It will go by like a vapor. Uh, you may see it as long, but indeed it is short compared to eternity. Very, very short. Uh, it's a small, small time frame that we have here. And we have to use this time frame to understand this letter and these letters that, was, that were given, uh, revealed <clears throat> unto prophets in the Old Testament, the apostles, and many servants. Uh, to understand and know who our Creator is. Without these books, we have no idea who our Creator is. And uh, But God has given us these 66 books to be led by uh, the Scriptures and by His Spirit and to navigate on this journey of life, to go in the right direction in our physical walk and our spiritual walk as well. And so this evening's lesson uh, is entitled the God of war and the God of peace. The God of war and uh, the God of peace. And I want to start here with a few scriptures in uh, James chapter 5 verse 4. This was uh, taught a few weeks ago where the Ozan mentioned this word concerning Sabaoth. Sabaoth. And many times I've read that word, I always thought it, mean, it meant um, Sabbath when I read it uh, I was always thinking that it, it meant Sabbath and uh, I think Brother Henry also mentioned that he thought it meant the same thing but it has a different meaning in James chapter 5 verse 4 uh, the scripture says uh, behold the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields which is of you kept back by fraud crieth and the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth and that word is dealing with talking about God and the definition of it is 4519 armies uh, a military epithet so he is the God of armies he's the God of war and if you look at the threats that are on the news between one country versus another country I'll nuke you, I'll, I'll bomb you, I have a stronger airplane than you, a faster airplane than you that can travel at so much speed. You know, they go back and forth comparing each other's strength from Russia to U.S. to China to other countries, Iran, you know, and they threaten each other. Um, but none of those threats can compare to God's threats. Uh, none of those armies or powers can compare to God's powers. It's no comparison at all. Uh, first off, they have those things because God allowed them to have those things. He put, him, put it in the earth for them to have uh, those things, to actually even create them. Uh, but the idea is that He is the God of war. The, from the beginning to the end, He can plan and execute judgment based off your ways, your steps, and your doings. It also is mentioned in Romans chapter 9, verse 29. It mentions it again. That same word, the scripture says in verse 29, he says, I want to actually start at verse 27. Isaiah also cried concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved, for he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness. Because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. He says, and Isaiah said before, except the Lord of Sabaoth had left us a seed, we had been as Sodom and been made like unto uh, Gomorrah. And so here he's mentioning again uh, concerning the comparison in verse 29. Uh, except the seed was left, they would have been like Sodom and Gomorrah. And so we want to look at this evening the, the thoughts that God has in the scriptures concerning war against the evil and the peace that he has planned for the good because he actually prepares peace for those, and we want to be on that side, saints. We want to be on the side where God has peaceful thoughts toward us. He plans and prepares uh, for us to live in peace and also in heaven, a home in heaven. Look at also uh, Matthew chapter, I want to look at Matthew chapter 18. 
Matthew chapter 18, to look at what Christ had, has for us concerning imagination, His imagination, and what He has created for us to imagine on what He does to the wicked. Look at verse... Uh, Look at verse, I want to start at verse 1 actually. At the same time came the disciples of Jesus saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Jesus called a little child to him and set him in the midst of them. And said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoso shall receive one such little child in my name, receiveth me. It's dealing with Christianity, Christian. He says in my name. Verse 6, but here's where he has a, uh, pre a requisite, prerequisite, uh, a thought for us to, to take in. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which, which believe in me, it were better for him that a milestone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must needs be that offenses come. Woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. Now here, we have that word offend. Um, Jesus said, blessed is a man that is not offended in me. That means the truth, not offending the truth. Here is dealing with, but whoso shall offend one of these little ones. Verse 5 is saying that this little child in my name, meaning Christian, is the little one. And he says, which believeth in me. Now he draws this picture. It's better for him. That's better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depths of the sea. Now if you, something that's something that we've never seen before, somebody uh, hanged around the neck, they throw a catapult and they throw the stone in the ocean, also follows the man with the rope, with the neck around his, around his neck and he drowns. Jesus is saying that's better uh, because this is how God loves his children, the Christian nation. And this God of war is painting a picture concerning his anger towards those who oppose saints, his children. Amen. And if you look at all the armies in the world, the militaries, uh, all the wrath and the anger that they want to show or that they threaten, no one can threaten the Savior. No one can threaten it with the nuke. No one can threaten him with any type of uh, militant device to cause him to not uh, cause him to not execute judgment in the day of judgment. He is going to show wrath when he returns in mid air with his angels in flaming fire. Look at verse eight. Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them off and cast them from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life halt or maimed. Rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. Now, we're reading this, but he actually said this. And he's, he's putting a comparison concerning sin and concerning the flames of fire. And he's making a comparison. So you can picture in your mind cutting your hand off, cutting your foot off. Because he said it's better to enter into life halt or maim. Than having two hands, two feet, and thrown down. Verse 9, And if thy eye offend thee, plug it out and cast it from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life with one eye, rather than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. Take heed that you despise not one of these little ones. Again, he returns. He returns first. First he speaks about the saints, the Christians. What happens if you offend them? And then he talks personal about you. What can offend you? To keep you from going into everlasting heavens. And if you don't have this mindset. This mindset of cutting quickly. He wants to picture this. Put this in your mind. So you can understand the realization of how hell is going to be. He says verse 10. For I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my father. Which is in heaven. Saints this is the most elite military army that has ever existed and will ever exist as God, Christ the Holy Ghost, angels there is nothing that can compare to this and because 
there is no one that can help you out of his hand when he's when your wrath is upon you it's needful to take heed to his will to be his friend to be his child his son his daughter have fellowship with him he is our creator but he can be our worst enemy at the same time look at uh, Jeremiah chapter 23 verse 24 so look at a, a thought here Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 24 and Jeremiah through the Holy Ghost teaches us in verse 23, I want to start Jeremiah 23, 23. He says, Am I, am I a God at hand, saith the Lord, and not a God afar off? Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him, saith the Lord? Do not I fill heaven and earth, saith the Lord? I have heard what the prophet said that prophesied lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. Again, can anyone hide himself in secret places that he cannot see him? He can hear all, he can see all. And the answer to that is no. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, we have a scenario here where the first creation, the first two that were ever created, they committed a sin. They took heed to Satan in taking a bite uh, from the fruit that was forbidden, that God said, do not eat the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. The scripture said in verse number 7, Genesis 3, 7, and the eyes of them both were open. And they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. They heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife, the Bible says, hid themselves. They hid themselves. Now God already told us through Jeremiah, can any man hide himself in secret places? No. From the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, where art thou? Now he knew where he was. But this is something that is a sad, sad case because he's not supposed to be hiding. He's not supposed to be hiding. And he says, verse 10, And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. And I hid myself. Okay, try to explain it. And he said, Who told thee that thou was naked? Was thou, hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee thou that thou shouldest not eat. And the man said, The woman which, whom thou gavest to me, she gave me the tree. The Lord God said to the woman, What is it that thou hast done? The woman said, The serpent begot me, and I did eat. So they're blaming each other. They're blaming each other. In this scenario, the man blames the woman. The woman tries to blame the serpent, but both are guilty. Uh, they knew they were guilty because they hid. And look at Numbers uh, chapter 32. Verse 23. Numbers 32, 23. I'll be with you, sister. The scripture says in Numbers 32, 23. It says, Behold, but if ye will not do so. He says, Behold, ye have sinned against the Lord, and be sure your sin will find you out. Now this he mentions in verse 22. He says, Uh... No, I'm sorry, verse 20. Moses said unto them, If you will do this thing, if you will go on before the Lord to war, and will go all of your arm over Jordan before the Lord until he hath driven out his enemies before, and from before him, and the land be subdued before the Lord, then afterward ye shall return and be guiltless before the Lord and before Israel, and this land shall be a possession. But if you will not do so, behold, ye have sinned against the Lord, and ye, and be sure your sin will find you out. He's telling them, you guys need to go out to war. Today, the war is spiritual. We have to war spiritually to defend what Christ has for us, what He died for on the cross, the body of Christ. This is God's army, which is spiritual. Verse 23 says, And be sure your sin will find you out. This is the same individual who hit the rock. This is the same individual who actually had his sin found out and was unable to go to the promised land because of his Amen. sin. So the statement that he made, your sin will find you out, actually return upon him. Recognize saints, Moses was sad that he couldn't go in. He wanted to go in. He was laboring year after year in the desert. Year after year. And this sin caused him to not enter in. Amen. And it found him out. 
Now, this mention, he says, and be sure your sin will find you out. So playing hide and go seek like Adam and Eve, uh, it doesn't work. Trying to hide your sin from God, from heaven, it doesn't work. The Bible says it will find you out. In Genesis chapter 4, I'll be with you. Sister, uh, let Genesis chapter 4, looking at verse uh, 14. This is where Cain, he slayed his brother, he killed his brother. And in verse 13, this is where the punishment, punishment was given, the curse that was given unto him. Because him, he shed his brother's blood. He said, the, the ground that he tills is not going to bring forth his strength. He's going to be a vagabond on the earth. Verse 13, Cain said unto the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth and from the face of from thy face shall I be hid, and I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth. And it shall come to pass that every one that findeth me shall slay me. He'll, so he recognizes, he recognizes the law of sowing and reaping. He recognizes my sin is going to find me out. He says in verse 15, The Lord said to him, Therefore whosoever slayed Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him. Sevenfold the Lord set a mark upon him, upon Cain, lest any finding him she killed him. And so that mark was placed upon him. So, you know, God showed mercy in not having that uh, reaping of death unto Cain for his iniquity. Because Cain recognized that my sin is going to find me out. Uh, Sister Linda had her hand up. Can you go back to uh, Matthew 18? Matthew 18, okay. Yeah, Matthew 18, verse 18, what verse? At the 18.10? Okay. All right. When it said, you know, when it said, speaking about the angels, mm -hmm. take heed that you despise not one of these little ones, for I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of the Father which is in heaven. Is that saying that, we, this is saying, two step that we got angels individually and all together for us? Or no. Our God and angels for us? Well, this, this is not saying that we have everyone, every saint, an individual angel. It's not saying that. But all those angels, they are. Uh, yeah, they, they are. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 1 that they're ministering uh, spirits uh, as well. So they do, from the Old Testament and the New Testament, they show, there's different scriptures that show that they do different works for us. Uh, in the kingdom, works for God, for the saints. Uh, in the kingdom, they woke up Peter when he was in jail. They opened the doors for, for Peter. Uh, and uh, after he left the jail, he went to the saints afterward. In the New Testament, when um, I believe it was um, Zacchaeus or Zacharias, um, trying to remember the name of, uh, I believe it's in Luke. Luke chapter 1 has that answer. But can, uh, say, can I say that I have a guardian angel in heaven? You know, before me, I have a guardian angel that watches over me and keeps me from wrong statements. Well, that statement. statement of, yeah. Well, God sends angels depending on His, according to His will, right, right. depending on different works. Uh, so, concerning I have a guardian angel, that's something that uh, it comes from the world. The, the terminology comes yeah. from the world. Yeah. Uh, but concerning the scriptures, I don't see a scripture where each person has their own personal angel. You know, in the Catholic Church, actually, they they, they teach something yeah. similar. You know, they pray to angels. Uh, this is my angel. Uh, they they say certain things like that. But the idea is that each individual who has their own personal one, you know, um, that's something that I don't, I don't find in the scriptures where, you know, they call them by name. But the angel that Jesus is speaking to us, for us all as a whole, that's in the church. Yes, in the church, in the and kingdom. For us all, on our behalf, there, we'll be joining them, I guess. We'll be saying yeah, the Bible them. says in Revelation that there are brethren. That's why the angel told John, because John began to worship the angel. And the angel, the angel said, you know, get up. Worship so God. We don't look and say like they said we got individual angels. We look at them as being our brethren that we will join if we are to be saved. Repeat that again. We don't look at it and say like they said, or like people say, I got a God and angel. We look at it the angels that, we, that will be our brethren if we be saved. Yes, exactly. Not That's why the angel said. I, either, but all of them. Yeah, they're all going to be our, our family because Ephesians talks about the family of God is named in heaven and in earth. And so, yeah, he calls us brethren and of the prophets. 
So we are related. Uh, the Bible says, Jesus said as well concerning uh, they will be like the angels. So we'll be in heaven like the angels. And, and the Bible says in this verse that in heaven uh, their angels do all, always behold the face of my Father uh, which is in heaven. They're always ready to be dispatched out to do work for God. And so, yeah. Yeah. And so one of the differences that... Mm -hmm. And the, the Bible also talks about in uh, the book of Peter that even angels desire to look into, you know, the things that happen in the kingdom of God. Uh, I believe it's in, in the book of Peter, Second Peter, I believe, chapter 1. Second Peter, chapter 1. Uh, I believe it's in verse... Let me see... I'll find it here, but it does mention that 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 the uh, angels they desire to look into. It's First Peter actually, First Peter, chapter one, verse uh, twelve. It says, "Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire." To look into, and so the, the angels desire to look into. You know, the Holy they know the Holy Ghost has been sent down uh, to the saints, uh, and that's something that they, they they desire to look into. That in the sense of they want to know what's going on with the brethren, because they have love for the saints, uh, for the for us as well. No, because they're there are angels in heaven. Exactly. That, that's right. I can and think it, of that and just, according know, to what is written. Amen. Amen. And it's God's will, whether He just protects you uh, through the Holy Ghost, through His power, or God could send out an, an angel, or no, or angels, depending on the scenario that, you know, to do a certain will or a work. And so we don't know th some of those details, even as Paul talked about, yeah. you know, paradise, you know, things which are unlawful to speak of. Yeah. And so we, we don't know. Uh, concerning when, you know, God sends an angel or angels, or if God just does it through His Holy Ghost, you know, if you uh, you're going through something, you know, the angels of God save me. Well, maybe it was God in, instead of the angels, you know. So you, we can't really say, but we know through the scriptures we get details of how uh, God sent down His angels from the Old Testament to Samson's parents, you know, to the New Testament uh, with uh, in. Even as Luke, you know, Luke chapter 1, where Zechariah and Elizabeth, uh, uh, he went to Zechariah and spoke with him. Of course, Zechariah didn't believe, and what the angel did was, um, he was mute. He couldn't speak. Uh, he was dumb. In verse 20, Luke 1, 20, it says, Behold, thou shalt be dumb, and not be able to speak until the day that these things shall be performed, because thou believest not my words. You see that? But which shall be fulfilled in their season. And the people waited for Zechariah and marveled that he tarried so long in the temple. And when he came out, he could not speak unto them. And they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple. For he beckoned unto them and remained uh, speechless. And so, that's what happened to Zechariah because he didn't believe uh, God's word that was presented uh, by the angel at the time. Amen. Did I answer your question, sister? Amen. Amen. So, uh, in continuation, saints, uh, there's another thought here in Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19, where we have uh, the vengeance of Christ and what he thinks about toward those who disobey him and who do not desire to follow Christ here on earth. Look, Luke, Luke chapter 19. I want to start here. Look at verse number, let me see, I want to start at, this is a parable of the ten pounds, parable of the ten pounds. I want to start here at verse number 13. He says, and he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, occupy till I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a message after them saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. And it came to pass that when he was returned, having received the kingdom, then he commanded these servants to be called unto him, to whom he had given the money, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. 
Then came the first, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained ten pounds. And he said unto him, Well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in a very little, have thou authority over ten cities. And the second came, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained five pounds. And he said likewise to him, Be thou also over five cities. And another came, saying, Lord, behold, here is thy pound, which I have kept laid up in a napkin. For I fear thee, because thou art an austere man, thou takest up that thou layest not down, and reapest that thou didst not sow. Now, these uh, ten pounds, they're supposed to be trading. Uh, they're supposed to be trading their time for spirituality and labor in the kingdom of God to multiply spirituality in the work in the church through the saints and communication of the scriptures, communication through prayer, consistent trading of the time or their labors for what God desires uh, them to do. Verse 22, And he said unto them, Out of thine own mouth will I judge thee, thou wicked servant. Thou knewest that I was an austere man, taken up that I lay not down, and reaping that I did not sow. Wherefore then gavest not thou my money unto the bank, that at my coming I might have required mine own with usury. And he said unto them that stood by, Take from him the pound and give it to him that hath ten pounds. Now I want to make a comparison here. Because at my job there's, uh, there's project managers, project coordinators who I work with. And it's interesting because the, mo the person who does the most work and who has the most successful projects they give him more work or more projects and at certain times uh, physically the person may get overwhelmed you know if it's too much but the idea is that he's making a comparison spiritually that God gives more spirituality um, to an individual who gives out more and so we're saved sanctified been washed by the blood we're saints in the church so are we just to keep this for ourselves this wisdom this knowledge God wants us to not keep it for ourselves. He give it, gave it to us so we can give it to others. That's our labor, is to share with others that others may be either comforted in the kingdom, that they may be led from the air of the wicked, either in the church or out the church, to come out from among them and be saved. We are to be trading and multiply what God has given us and give it out. Um, verse 25 and they said to him, Lord, he had ten pounds. For I say unto you, that unto every one which hath shall be given. And from him that hath not, even that he hath shall be taken away from him. Look at verse 27. And this is a picture that God wants us to picture. But those mine enemies which were not, which were not that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them. He says, before me, and kill them before me. Now, in the Old Testament, uh, Samuel, he destroyed the king of Agag. He cut him into pieces, uh, piece by piece. Saul didn't want to kill him, and Samuel came and did the work for him. This is a job that Saul was supposed to do. So, concerning this imagery, if you could imagine, I know you've seen movies of individuals getting cut asunder you know one of the movies is 300 spartans where the graphics uh, of the detail that is in that movie god wants us to imagine this is what i will do unto those who do not want me to reign over them some don't desire the reign of christ concerning the the government whether it be elders or deacons teachers or ministers they desire to create their own government they don't want Christ to rule over them. They want to establish their own rule, their own government, their own head. This is evil and bad because the devil wanted the same thing in Isaiah 14, where he said, I will be like the Most High God. And saints on earth may get that same mindset. I don't want to be like God. I don't want his rules. I want to make up my own rules. Look at Matthew chapter 26, verse 52. Matthew 26, 52. The scripture says in this verse, this is where when they wanted and they did uh, arrest Jesus Christ, uh, 
Look at verse 50. I want to start verse 50. Jesus said unto him, Friend, wherefore art thou come? Then came they and laid hands on Jesus and took him. And behold, one of them, he says, which were with Jesus, stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck a servant of the high priest and smote off his ears. Dealing with Peter. Verse 52, Then said Jesus unto him, Put up again thy sword unto his place, for all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. This was the same thing we read in Genesis, where Cain uh, was supposed to receive that same reward that he gave unto his brother Abel concerning killing him. But God put a mark on him. Look at verse 52. Then said Jesus unto him, Put up again thy sword into his place. I want to look at verse 53. It says, Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels. But how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled that thus it must be? Again, the image that Christ is picture, picturing and wants us to picture in our heads is, if I want to, I can send legions, 12 legions of angels at once to destroy the men that are before him. So this is the mindset of Christ. A lot of individuals in the world, they think of Christ as, oh, he's, he's a, a shepherd, he's a, he's a nice guy, peaceful, he's love. But they only picture that image and don't look at the other side of God concerning sending legions, 12 legions of angels to destroy the enemies of God. Now, the will of God was not to send legions of angels at this time, but it was to die on the cross. But understand that Christ still has his mindset of knowledge and requesting from the Father to send down angels if it's his will. Understand that if this was God's will, this would have occurred. However, it wasn't at this time frame, but we are to take heed, saints, because who, can, who on earth can actually fight against these 12 legions of angels? What army? Russia? America? China? Maybe the Indian uh, army who everybody goes to to train. And so nobody can go against uh, this militant army, which is eternal, by the way. Look at another scripture here in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Because in the Old Testament, they had, after they went through the Red Sea, after the Hebrews dwelt over 400 years in Egypt, and God turned the water to blood, He, put, he brought frogs upon the land, He filled the land with lice, the air was filled with flies, the cattle were dead in the Egypt, in Egyptian region, the flesh of the Egyptian was full of boils. The hail came down as never before in the history of Egypt. Hail mixed with fire. Uh, you have locusts eating up the crops. Darkness so dark that you could feel the darkness. It could be felt, it says. And not to mention the death of the firstborn of every Egyptian in that land. And afterward, you would think the Egyptian and Pharaoh, they would cease from seeking to... Uh, to bond the Israelites, the Hebrews, but nay, they continued and they chased after them and the Red Sea is where they were engulfed and killed. Now afterward, look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, looking at verse 1. He says, I'm over brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all of our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea, this is the, end of the Red Sea, and were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea, and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with many of them God was not well pleased. Why was He not well pleased? For they, it says, many. Remember the Bible says in Matthew, many called, few were chosen. For many were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples to the intent, the intentions. We should not lust after evil things, as they also lusted. Neither be idolaters, as were some of them. As it was as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. They made a calf, a golden calf. Aaron told them to take off their golden earrings. And he made a lie and said, all of a sudden this golden calf came out. And so they, they had idolatrous images. Verse 8, Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed 
and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Three and twenty thousand. There was a story where Phineas, um, in the Old Testament, where he was in the congregation, and uh, I believe it was a Midianitish woman who he who one of the servants of Israel brought in. He was sleeping with her in the tent. Phineas got a, a javelin. He went in the tent, and as they were sleeping with each other, he struck both of them down, and both of them died while they were on top of each other. And as the spear went through, and uh, he was blessed. Afterward, neither let us tempt uh, Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed uh, of uh, serpents. The Bible says, now, Moses made a golden serpent. And the golden serpent, whoever seen the golden serpent, as they raised their eyes, uh, they, were not, they were not killed of the serpents. The Bible says also in uh, John three fourteen, he says, uh, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be uh, lifted up. Now, in the New Testament, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, the Old Testament, that serpent uh, actually was worshipped by the Hebrews years after they entered into the land of Moses. They were worshipping uh, the golden uh, serpent that Moses had, and I believe Hezekiah destroyed it because it was supposed to be used for history, for learning, but except they started worshipping it, so Hezekiah busted it up and broke it. And so, in verse 10, neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and were destroyed. The Bible says of the destroyer. Now that's the title that the Bible is giving the God of heaven uh, destroyer in this verse. And I want to look at uh, the Greek definition 3644. He says a ruiner. Uh, a ruiner. Someone who someone who just completely ruins. Uh, it says in verse number 11 uh, now all these things happen unto them for our examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Uh, so I want to also look at this connection that is made concerning destroyer and the word destroyed in verse number 9. It says, And were destroyed of serpents, neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. It also is mentioned as a venomous serpent, a venomous serpent. And so, saints, these examples are written that we should not lust after, after evil things. Verse 11, it says the word examples again. They happen unto them for our examples that uh, we should not suffer the same consequences that they also suffer. Now, the title of tonight is the God of war and the God of peace. So God also plans peace for us. John 14, John chapter 14. You hear this many times when you go to funerals. Uh, depending on the walk, depending on who it is, it's usually a lie if it's quoted versus or towards a denomination. Look at verse number 1, uh, John 14, 1, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. This is a blessing to have as well. And God wants us to hold this in our hearts. That God is someone who prepares, is preparing a place for us. Uh, many times as adults, we usually prepare things for ourselves, our food, our bed, our homes. But it's a blessing to know that in the heavens our creator is preparing a place for us a place that we're not going to build a place that we don't have to buy food a place that's going to be eternal it's going to be uh, a place where there'll be peace forever no more war no more pain after this uh, short temporary life is over so it's needful to take heed to what the warnings were mentioned in first Corinthians chapter 10 uh, concerning our walk that we not lose this mansion, this place that God has for us uh, in the heavens. Look at uh, also John chapter 17. John chapter 17. To understand the comfort that God has. Remember, the book of Timothy says that Je Jesus is a mediator between God and man. He intercedes for us. He does intercession for us. Uh, looking at verse 9, John 17, 9. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me. For they are thine. This is why it's needful to be a part of the body of Christ. And to call others who are lost. 
because those who are lost are in the world. Those who are lost do not give prayers by Christ uh, for them. Verse 10, all mine are thine and thine are mine and I am glorified in them. This is talking about the saints when he says mine are thine. Just because he died for the sins of the world does not mean that everyone is his. It mentions that those that are in the world have the opportunity to receive salvation if they are obedient. Verse 11, And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. And I am come to thee, Holy Father. Keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. And now come I to thee, and these things speak I in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. Uh, we'll look at verse 19. It says, And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. So this lesson, this lesson tonight is also needful for us to be sanctified. Because if we're not clean, how can we communicate to others so they can be clean as well? Uh, look at verse 20. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. That's dealing with us, uh, future tense as well, saints. So this is a blessing to have uh, this, this peace, this God of peace. He's for us. He prays for us. He prepares uh, for us and he plans uh, for us. Look at Exodus 3.8. Exodus 3.8 as we read. Because the Hebrews were uh, promised and they did receive a land. Exodus chapter 3 verse 8. The scripture says in this particular verse. He says, And I have come down to deliver them out of thine hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land, out of that land unto a good land, a large unto a land flowing with milk and honey. Unto the place of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And so for us, what is our promise? What is our promise? Hebrews chapter 11, verse 9. What is our land that we seek? Look at Hebrews 11. Uh, looking at, I want to start at verse 9. At this time, the scripture mentions, By faith he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is, uh, is God. Look at verse 6, 13. It says, These all died in faith, not having received the promise, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. You see that? For they that say such things declare, the Bible says, they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they, had, they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country. You see that? That is a heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them, as the word prepared again, prepare for them a city. So God has prepared for us a city in the heavens. So what do we do? We prepare ourselves in our walk. Have your lamps always filled with oil as you walk. So you won't be like the five foolish virgins who did not make it in when the husband came. You'll have your lamps filled. And on that day when the husband returns, you enter in and we will enter in on that day to receive, be received by Christ into everlasting, uh, everlasting promises in the heavens. So for those listening, understand that Christ came, He died, He buried according to the Scriptures. The Bible says uh, that they were pricked in the heart. They said, men and brethren, what should we do? Verse 38 says, Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. This promise is still in effect today. Peter also mentioned in 1 Peter chapter 3, concerning water, he says, it's the like figure where it's a, even baptism does also not save us. Not the putting away the filth of the flesh, but is the answer of the good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Where is he now? We read it in John uh, chapter 17. He's gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God. Angels and authorities and powers be made subject unto him where he has prepared a place uh, for us. 
Understand that Christ uh, will return, saints. We have to be prepared. Either he will be the Lord of Sabaoth, the Lord of War, or he will be the Lord of Peace. Either the God of War or the God of Peace, depending on our ways. And all we have to do is be submissive, be obedient to his will. It's not difficult. It's not grievous. The Bible says, grieve not the Holy Ghost, which is your seal, which you've been given. Do not quench him, saints. He's a gift that was given to us. No one can give us a gift like the Holy Spirit on earth. Someone may give you a million dollars, a billion dollars, and you may use it up. You may buy everything this earth has, you know, in store or is for sale. But you cannot buy eternal life. You can't buy eternal life in the heavens. And that's what we strive for. That's why we are putting our pounds and our talents in, trading and laboring uh, to get that reward in the heavens. So at this time, saints, uh, we'll be closing with a song and also...